I think everybody knows how much it sucks to have a bad workout. And if it's bad enough, it can throw off, you know, even the rest of your day outside of the gym, maybe even an entire training cycle. So today I'm going to explain why that happens and give you a few strategies so that you can prevent bad training days altogether. So the first thing you have to understand is why these bad training sessions happen. And I'm going to set the physical reasons aside, right? You could have a bad training program. You could have not slept the night before, whatever. There could be reasons why you underperformed. Underperforming is not the same thing as having a bad workout, all right? Those are two separate things. A bad workout is one that you feel disappointed in. And the reason you feel disappointed is because your expectations for that training session didn't line up with reality. So let me give you two different examples. In one example, you didn't sleep the night before, you had a fight with your girlfriend, you got fired from your job, and you go into the gym thinking, oh man, I'm not even going to survive this training session. And then you manage to hit like decent numbers. They're not you know, what you had planned for that day. But you walk out and you're like, hey, you know what? I got it done. You didn't have a bad workout. Compare that to, I'm fired up, I took three scoops of C4, and this is my new training plan, and I'm going to break some world records, and you go in and you know your RP8 that was supposed to be 600 is instead 450, and you're just devastated. That's a bad workout. So that bad workout happened because you went into the gym expecting to hit a certain number, that 600, and you fell short of your expectations. That disconnect between expectations and reality is what creates the perception of a bad workout. Now, if you're a coach, it's really easy to look at an athlete's performance and break down objectively the reasons for a bad workout, adjust, and move on. But if you're the athlete, it's a lot more difficult because you're emotionally invested in that result, that outcome of the training session. You wanted to hit 600 because you wanted to break a world record and you wanted to know that you were on track for that world record, right? So the first thing that I would suggest if you run into this problem often or even at all is that you read up a little bit on the psychology of motivation and specifically you focus on the difference between process orientation and outcome orientation. The gist of it is that outcome, outcome orientation, you are only motivated to achieve your goal. Process orientation, you're motivated to go about things in the right way, right way, whatever that means for you. It gets more complicated than that, but I think if you understand the way that your brain works, the way that you feel motivated, you'll be better able to respond skillfully to those feelings of disappointment when you have a bad workout. Now, we could get into that a lot more, and a lot of people have written about it. Today, I want to focus on how to not have a bad workout in the first place, right? So you don't even have to worry about that stuff. And I honestly think this is possible. I think no matter what your goals are, it is possible to go into the gym, no matter how you feel, and always have a good training session all right so i'm going to give you three ways that you can accomplish this the first one throw numbers out the window unless you are peaking for a powerlifting meet you probably do not need specific training numbers in your plan they might be very helpful but you don't need them and they can be counterproductive if you are the type of person who gets very attached to them emotionally right if you don't hit the number that's on the sheet you're going to be frustrated or or if you don't hit the number that's on the sheet, or you don't feel like you can hit the number that's on the sheet, you're going to let your technique break down so that you can get it anyway. I got a lot of guys like that that I coach. Neither one of those is a good place to be. So the best solution is to kind of get away from those numbers. And I know that sounds a little bit weird, but there are a couple ways you can go about it. So first of all, let's take weight on the bar as a number. Many different ways you can get, a, get away from that, right? You can use RPEs or some other form of auto-regulation instead of weight on the bar. Right. So let's say, again, we'll use our example of I'm going to the gym. I'm supposed to hit 600. Right. Well, if I'm supposed to hit an RP8 instead of 600, if 450 is an RP8, hey, that's a good training day. And no, this isn't changing the outcome. It's changing the process. See, that's why that's important. If you can become more process oriented by using auto regulation instead of strict numbers, you're not going to be able, you're just not going to be able to have a bad workout because those expectations won't be in place. There are other strategies that you can use, right? You could use velocity-based training so that instead of, hey, instead of hitting 600, I'm supposed to hit a lift that moves at 0.15 meters per second, something like that, right? That you can always hit a lift that moves at 0.15 meters per second. It doesn't really matter what the number on the bar is because, hey, reality is we all have lives outside of the gym, whether you're Mr. Olympia or a guy just starting out in the gym the first day, and some of those things are going to affect your performance in the gym. Not everything is under your control. You can do the same thing. It's a little bit more tricky, but you can do the same thing with sets and reps. 
So one great way is to use set and rep ranges instead of strict set numbers of set and rep, right? So you'll see this listed all the time in programs, right? It'll be, you know, three to four sets of eight to 12 reps. But I think people try to always go on the upper end of that range, right? They always want four sets of 12. And that's just not necessary. The truth is the idea of progressive overload is a little bit overemphasized. The fact of the matter is the training stimulus is what provides growth. It's not the exact numbers, right? This applies to any situation. And so if you go in there and you're trying your hardest and you get three sets of eight instead of four sets of 12, there's a very good chance that you're going to grow just as well as if you had hit those four sets of 12, even, even if last week you were able to do four sets of 10, for example. John Meadows has a really good video about this. He's talking about um, how to progress for older lifters. And he says, hey, look, at some point you got to throw the logbook out the window because it's just going to hold you back. And I don't think you need to go that far, but I do think there's a lot of merit in the idea of, hey, I'm going to step back from trying to hit specific numbers, always trying to get a number PR in the gym. I'm going to focus more on a holistic approach, process orientation, whatever you want to call it. There's one last trick I want to mention here before I move on to the next tip, and that is the idea of volitional failure. This is a super cool one that I just recently learned about. Volitional failure just says you're done when you're done. I think everybody kind of knows the feeling of, man, I don't want to do another rep. I probably could, but I don't want to. And that is a perfectly valid training parameter. If you just want to put in, hey, I'm done when I'm done. I'm done when I feel done. I'm done when I hit volitional failure. And you stick to that and you're consistent with it. You will progress over time. It's, it's a really cool method. It's usually used in special populations, things like, um, let's say, pregnant women or people coming back from injury who need to listen to their bodies very, very carefully so they don't end up overreaching. But it will work almost just as well for at regular hard training people. So that's step one. Get away from the numbers entirely. Step two, become a, I'm calling it a lifelong learner. Little gimmicky, but I think the idea is really important. If you want to reach your physical potential, you cannot just focus on getting physically strong. You also have to develop mental strength or you have to progress mentally might be a more fair way to say that. So here are a few examples of what I mean by that. I think it's the easiest way to understand. You need to build a strong mind muscle connection if you want to be a pro bodybuilder. No matter how perfectly you follow a plan, follow a diet, how many drugs you take, how much cardio you do, if you don't develop a strong mind-muscle connection, you're never going to be the best bodybuilder you can be. Well, there are physiological aspects of mind-muscle connection, of course, but to a large extent, it's mental. All right. Now, that's a very, very simple example. I want to give you a few more examples because I really think this is an important and overlooked aspect of training. If you are a competitive powerlifter, and you are trying to improve your squat technique, in my opinion, it will greatly behoove you to learn a lot of functional anatomy or biomechanics. And the reason for that is if you learn those skills, you are going to be better able to analyze and identify and analyze flaws in your own technique, right? If you don't know anything about anatomy and your knees are coming in when you come out of the hole in the squat, you're not going to know what muscle groups to focus on. You're not going to know what's going on with your body. You're probably going to lack a little bit more, a little bit of kinesthetic awareness, and you're probably going to get frustrated very, very easily. A lot of people will try to fix their technique just by watching other lifters and trying to emulate them, whether it's online or in the gym. And that's a good strategy. That's tacit knowledge. I'll talk about that in another video. But in my opinion, it's not as effective as actually learning those uh, basic anatomy um, skills, we'll say. So I'm not saying you need to go take a class in a co college course in anatomy. All I'm saying is as you're training, try to understand, try to be mindful of how your body is moving through space. And then maybe after the gym, you go home and you look up a few Instagram videos about hip anatomy, let's say if you're squatting. Um, and then you try to visualize, okay, these feelings in the gym, what muscles was I moving? Over time, you will develop a functional um, ability to apply biomechanics in your own training. So that's, you know, it's a little bit more mm, vague, I'd say, than, hey, how much weight did I lift? But if you constantly look for opportunities to grow mentally like this in the gym, constantly look for opportunities to learn, you are always going to progress mentally, but also physically. It, it really is that important.
Um, a few other examples. These are going to be, uh, again, you can get creative with this. So let's say that you really struggle to give 100% effort on high rep sets. You tend to get to that volitional failure a little bit earlier than you would like. Every time you push past that point where you want to stop, that's a mental win in addition to a physical win. Regardless of how many reps you did, even if it wasn't a PR, if you pushed past the point where you wanted to stop, you can count that as a win. You can do the same thing with, let's say, rehab. Let's say you have this nagging shoulder injury, like I did, and you're just, you can't be bothered to perform your rehab or prehab exercises. They're too boring. Every time you go in and you do your rehab exercises, celebrate that because that is a mental win. That is building discipline in addition to everything you're doing to help your shoulder heal. Looking for ways to accumulate these mental wins throughout your training session will help to set expectations that are not directly, up, directly tied to one specific outcome. The more positive outcomes that can come from a training session, the more chances you have to have a good training day, right? Very, very simple. The third way that you can avoid ever having a bad workout is to push yourself really, really hard. I think everybody knows how difficult it is to work yourself into the ground, no matter what numbers you put up, and you leave the gym and you're like, man, I'm a piece of shit, I just suck. No, if you wiped yourself out, you feel good about that. Physiologically, you get those feel-good hor hormones, right? The, the equivalent of a runner's high. But then mentally, you also have that sense of satisfaction from having worked hard. I think that's more cultural than anything else. I don't really think it's necessary to work all that hard to reach your physical potential. Um, but I do think that if you can incorporate ways to train hard every day without impeding your recovery, then you're going to have more good workouts than not. And the, my personal favorite way to make sure I always have a good workout and always push myself hard is to include some assault bike work. You can do assault bike sprints if they're short duration sprints almost every day. And I guarantee if you're going all out, they will kick your ass. You can do a 50 calorie, calorie sprint. And if you're in shape, that takes 30 seconds. It will not impact your recovery the slightest bit, but it will wipe you out and you will know that you have worked hard. There are lots of other ways you can do this. You can do, you know, prowler work. You can do um, drop sets. It, there's plenty of other ways. You just have to be careful that you don't start adding junk volume because once you start adding junk volume, then you are really impeding your recovery and you're hurting yourself in the long run. So three different strategies. If you put them all together, I can pretty much guarantee you will never have a bad workout. And if you do have a bad workout, you go back to that mental win. You say, okay, well, what can I take away from this? What can I change in the future so that I set different expectations so that next time this doesn't happen again? And then you're learning from your mistakes. You're still progressing, and you can turn a, turn a loss into a win. So I hope you guys found this video helpful. Um, this is some stuff that I've had to work on a lot because I used to really, really beat myself up when I didn't hit the numbers that I wanted. And that took a lot of the enjoyment out of uh, you know something that I, I really love to do and something that I... Uh, was able to turn into a career, I think I could have had even more success and even more fun had I taken these lessons to heart earlier on. So um, I hope you find it helpful. If you have other strategies that you use to prevent that bad workouts or to deal with bad workouts, please leave those in the comments below. Um, if you prefer to um, read rather than listen, I have a link to this in article form, and I would love it if you guys would like and subscribe to my channel. That's all I got for you. Have a great day, and I will talk to you soon.